what is the maximum area of an isosceles trapezoid that has legs of length one and one base twice as long as the other? Let's draw such a trapezoid. So this is isosceles. So let's see here. Length of one, so I'm assuming that these guys, and then the base is twice as long. So if this whole thing, let's say, is 4x, that'll be 2x. So that's 2x. I'm just kind of labeling it. And then this I'll call y and y. So using the area of a trapezoid formula, that's going to be the f top plus the bottom divided by 2 times the height. So that basically is 3xy. And then using trigonometry, since this is uh, a right triangle, we can write that the sine, oh, I got to label an angle here. Uh, which angle are we going to label? This one, I guess. So the sine of theta would be y over 1, which is just y. And the cos of theta would be x over 1, which is just x. So this basically becomes 3 cos theta y, uh, sine theta. Yeah. And then we've got two of them. I'd, I'd, I'd rather have just one. Um, let me think about this for a second. Is that necessary? Yeah, I think it's better to just put one uh, trig uh, uh, component rather than two. So if I broke this up, let's say if I have a half and then two, and then I have cos theta, sine theta, that will be, I can use a trig identity there for this guy. That's sine two theta. So that's good. That, that now I just have sine, and that's three over two. Okay, so now we go back to the question: What is the max? So we want me, we want to maximize this area. Okay, well three over two is just three over two. So we have to obviously have to maximize sine of two theta. Well, what is the boundaries of sine of anything? The highest it can be is one, and the lowest it can be is negative one, right? So the maximum value for sine two theta is one. And therefore, the maximum value for the area is 3 over 2. And that means the answer is D. For complex numbers, U and V define the binary operation symbol as U symbol V is AC plus BDI. Suppose Z is a complex number such that Z symbol Z is Z squared plus 40. What is the magnitude of Z? So, oh boy. Um, let z equal a plus bi we'll, we'll use capital since we already have a plus bi there in terms of smaller letters yeah, I'm just trying to think where do, where do I even begin here um, let me just work with what they gave me so z symbol z is this z squared plus 40 correct but then z symbol if you use that operation on this guy with that being z then what you would get is a squared right it would be a times a plus b times b which is b squared i and that's z squared plus 40 okay and does that help me in any way hmm uh, not not at this point, but that's about as far as I can get there. So now let's look at Z, this Z guy, A plus B I. I'm going to try to get some Z squared there. I think that will help me. So if I do Z squared, it'll be A squared plus 2 A B I plus B squared I squared. And therefore that is A squared minus B squared because I squared is negative 1 plus 2abi. Okay, so now I'll plug that back into this side. So that just becomes a squared. Well, that doesn't become anything. It just stays the same. But then now this is a squared minus b squared plus 2abi, like that. Okay. So, hmm. Well, the a squareds go, right? Yeah, the a squareds go. So then we just have, well, what's remaining. 
There's a oh I forgot a forty. Yeah, don't forget the forty. This forty there. I guess we'll compare real and imaginary parts. Real and imaginary. Imaginary. So on this side, the real part. Uh, what is the real part on this side? There's nothing. There's no real part on this side because I took out the a squared. So it's 0. And the real part on this side is minus b squared plus 40. So b squared is equal to 40. So b is equal to root 40. And that is what? 2 root 10. And then the imaginary parts, well, on that side it's b squared. And on that side it's 2ab. So if you factor out the b, you get 2a. So that means a is equal to b over 2. And therefore, a would be root 10. And then what if finally we get to this magnitude. Magnitude is um, a squared plus b squared under the square root sign by definition. So a squared looks to me like 10. b squared would be 40. So that's going to be root 50. And root 50 is what, 5 root 2? So that is E. A rectangular box P has distinct edge lengths A, B, and C. The sum of the lengths of all 12 edges of P is 13. The sum of the areas of all six faces of P is 11 over 2. And the volume of P is a half. What is the length of the longest interior diagonal connecting the two vertices of P? So let's draw a diagram and let's see what we can do here. So this is a, a basic diagram. And let's label this A, B, and C. And then we are asked to uh, do some diagonals, right? So well that, that's not a very good diagonal, but it's supposed to be. <laughs> but that's OK. You, under, you guys understand. OK. So there's going to be a couple of Pythagorean relationships here. So first, let's just uh, put into equations the information they gave us in the question. So that's the first piece. And then the, 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 the next one would be just the face areas. That's 11 over 2, they're saying. And then, of course, the volume, ABC, is a half. OK? And then the, this, this D here, and then the big diagonal, um, you know, f the, the one that's sort of the hypotenuse, and that's a right angle. OK. So the D, the, that would basically be, this is C, right? So that would be B squared plus C squared using basic Pythagorean theorem. And then the big D, that would be A squared plus B squared. Uh, hold on, A, A squared plus D squared. Sorry, sorry. And so that basically means that D would be uh, equal to A squared plus B squared plus C squared. And then, therefore, d would be the square root of that whole thing, a squared plus b squared plus c squared. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to find the longest. So we're basically trying to find the value for big D. And obviously, we're going to be using those three equations, manipulating them somehow to eventually get that. OK, well, if you use a, not necessarily very fancy algebra, but if you use algebra, you will notice one thing that a squared plus b squared plus c squared is going to be a plus b all squared minus 2 times ab plus ac plus bc, right? You can expand it and see that both sides will be equal if you're not sure of that. Now, a plus b plus c from here, that is 13 over 4. And the this guy basically if you expand it all out is just this guy right here so that's going to be just 11 over 2 so that's just 11 over 2 so that will be 169 over 16 and therefore if i multiply top and bottom by 8 i will get 88 over 16 and that will be 81 over 16 now remember Theref this has got to be under the square root. So this would be 81 over 16 under the square root, and that'll be 9 over 4. So there we go. We got it. 9 over 4, and that would be D.
How many ordered pairs A, B of integers does the polynomial have three distinct integer roots? We have x to the power of 3 plus ax squared plus bx plus 6. And we want this to have three roots. So let's call those roots r1, r2, and r3. Now, normally a polynomial is of the form ax3 plus bx squared plus cx plus d, right? And using Vieta's, famous Vieta's formula, the, let me think about this for a second, the sum of the roots, which in this case are R1, R2, and R3, are on this guy, uh, minus, minus BA. And the product of the roots, which in this case would be R1 times R2 times R3, would be minus DA. So if we apply that to this, the product of the roots r1 times r2 times r3 would be minus dA. So d is 6 in that case, and a is just 1. So that's just minus 6. OK. So since the product of the roots are minus 6, and they're distinct, and they're integers, there can't be that many different possibilities. So let's see. Times r2 times r3 is minus 6. OK. And I, I think this should be fairly quick. Uh, there's not too many possibilities. Um, let's see how many we get. All right, so we have um, three numbers that multiply to get negative 6. So 1, 2, and 3 would give 6. But one of these got to be a negative in order to give that negative. So we can have a negative there. You have a negative there, or we can have uh, a negative here. So those three will work. So then that exhausts that. Is there other, any other way of getting three numbers to multiply to six? Three integers, I should say. Well, the three, two, one, that six, one, one would do it. But then, of course, one of these has to be negative, that one. Yeah. And if we made the negative, if we made the six negative, then it would be one and one. But that's not possible. That's not allowed because they have to be distinct. Are there any other possibilities? You know, I think I missed this one. If you have all three of them negative, then you'd have a negative six. Okay. So I think that exhausts it finally. So how many did I get? One, two, three, four, five. So five solutions, and therefore the answer to this is eight. Suppose a, b, and c are positive integers such that a over 14 and b over 15 and equals c over 210. Which of the following statements are necessarily true? Before we jump right into this, uh, let me do a very quick uh, summary of what is GCD for those of you who may not remember. GCD, greatest common divisor. So the best thing to do is to, if you have two numbers, let's just make up two numbers. Uh, so 14... Let's just use 14 and 15, why not? The very first thing to do is to break them up into their prime factors. So this would be 2 to the power of 1, 7 to the power of 1. This is 3 to the power of 1, 5 to the power of 1. And then for greatest common divisor, you think smallest. I know that's counterintuitive, but that's how it's done. And let me explain what I mean by that. You look at the smallest power of each prime number. So for example, if I were to say, what is this? Well. For the first prime number that we are in discussion, that's included, it's 2, right? What's the smallest power of that? Where here, it's 1, but here, there's nothing. There's actually, there's no 2. It's 2 to the power of 0. So the smallest power of 2 is actually 0, if you look at both of those. If you look at this guy, and then if you look at the next guy. Similarly for 3. The smallest power is also 0, because there's no 3 in there. Smallest power of 5 is 0, and the smallest power of 7 is 0. So this actually is 1. 
Now let's do one where you won't get one. So let's try two to the power of one, seven to the power of one, 11 to the power of two, 11 to the power of one, 13 to the, uh, 13 to the power of two, like that. Okay, same kind of story, think smallest. For two, it would be zero. For seven, it would be zero. For 11, it would be one this time. For 13, it would be zero. So this is 11. So I just wanted to do that crash course to kind of familiarize you with what is GCD. All right, so let's go to the question now. We want to see which one of these three is true. Okay, no problem. Let's see. Let's start with the first one. If we can prove that it's false, then we can just get rid of it. So let's see if there's a counterexample. And I quickly can see that if I use a equals 3 and b equals 5, I can get a counter example. First, let me simplify this. This simplified would be 15a plus 14b is equal to c. So if a is 3 and b is 5, c would be 15 times 3 plus 14 times 5, which is 45 plus 70 which is 115. So therefore, if you look at one, GCD of A14 would be the GCD of 314, and that's the GCD of three and two times seven, and that is equal to one. So that part is so far true. Let's try uh, GCD of B15, that is the GCD of 5 and 15, and that is the GCD of 5 and 3 times 5, so that's going to be 5, correct? So that obviously is not equal to 1, but they're saying or, so we're still kind of valid, we're just, we just said, okay, that one's true so far. Yeah. Okay, so now let's let's see if this f holds true. The last one, which is GCD of C two ten. That would be the GCD of C, which I calculated to be one fifteen, and two ten. So if I break it up into prime factors, what's that? Five times something. Five times eight. I th no wait wait hold on. It would be 5 times, um, let's see, 23. Yeah, 5 times 23. And then 210 is 2 times 3 times 5 times 7. So this GCD is 5, which is not equal to 1. So it's not equal to 1. So this is false. So that's false. So that means we can look at the answer choices and eliminate we can eliminate A, we can eliminate B, and we can eliminate C. Because they're saying which of the following is true. So now we're just down to D and E. Okay. So we're down to just D and E. So I guess we now concentrate on the second guy. Which is, if the GCD of C210 is 1, then the GCD of A14 is 1, or the GCD of B115 is 1. Okay. Well, let's see. If I do that, if the GCD of C210 is 1, well, we're no longer using this anymore. This has already been done. We're just going to use something else. If the GCD is 1, then that means that the C cannot have any of the same prime factors as 210. So what was 210 again? It was 2 times 3 times 5 times 7, right? So C cannot have any of those prime factors. So let's just say it's something else. It's 11 times 13 because it cannot have 2 or 3 or 5 or 7 because if it did, the GCD would not be 1. Okay, that takes care of the first part of part 2. So now we've got to concentrate on this. So since, uh, where is that equation? Way up here. Yeah, That's still valid because that's valid, right? 15a plus 14b is c. 
So 15a plus 14b is c. That's still valid. So what did I do? I set c to be 11 times 13, right? Because I can't have any of these prime factors. So c is whatever. 11 times 13 is what? 143? Okay, so I've got to find an a and b that, fig that make that uh, 143. And I think 3 and 7 would do it. So 45 plus 98. Yeah, 3 and 7. So that means my a is 3 and my b is 7. So let's see. The second part of this GCD of that and GCD of this. Okay, let's see if that holds true. GCD of uh, A14, which would be GCD of 3 times 2 times 7. That is indeed 1. And then the next one, GCD of B15. Is it B15? I just double double. Yeah, it is B15. That's going to be GCD of 7 times 3 times 5, and that is also 1. So there you go. This checks out. So that means B is true. Uh, B is true. So if B is true, then 2 is, is true. Therefore, it's answer choice E, because this is stating that 3 only, that they're basically saying that 2 is false in choice D, so it's choice E. In coin land, there are three types of coins, each worth 6, 10, and 15. What is the sum of the digits of the maximum amount of money that is impossible to have? So let's say we have some amount, and normally the amount, if it's made with these three coins, would be 6 times something plus 10 times something and times f plus 15 times something, where A, B, and C represent the number of coins of each denomination. But they're saying that they want you to find an amount that is impossible to have. So that means something that could not be made with uh, that combination. Okay, so I think hmm, there's, there's going to be a lot maximum. Hmm. There's going to be quite a few that you can't get, right? So I guess eventually you get to a point where there's a maximum. And then after that, everything you can get. So we have to figure out how to figure that out. Okay, well, the first few, obviously, you can't get. But the six, you can. And let me just fill this out first. So now let's circle what we can. We can get a six, for example, uh, if B and C were zero, right? And all multiples of six you could get. So all these guys you can get. That's not a problem. Now, uh, you can get 10 for the same reason if A and C were 0. So all multiples of 10. Okay, well, in that list. And then multiples of, let's see. Now I have to start thinking what, it, what I can. If you have a multiple of 10, if you can get anything that is 6 more. So because you can have that adding an additional 6. So 6 more, 12 more, 18 more you know, 24 more, that you can. And then same thing with these guys, 6 more, 12 more than the multiple of 10. And then let me see here. Um, same thing, if you have 15 and you add another 6, you can get uh, that to be made. And then 25, I think you get with the 10 and a 15 if A is 0 and B and C are 1. And then if you add another 6 to that, you can get 31. And 35, you can get with two 10s and a 15, correct? 10, 20, yeah. So I think what that does, and then every single one after that, you can, whatever you have, you can just add 6 to it. And you will be able to get the next number. So, for example, you can add 6 to that to get 37, 38, 39, uh, 40, 41, 42. And then it just keeps going. So I think you can get everything indefinitely. So what was the largest that we could not get? And that looks like the 29. So a little bit of work there. And where's... Oh, the sum of the digits. Ah, I'm looking for 29 in here. There is no 29. Sum of the digits is 2 plus 9, and that's 11.
I think they did that on purpose because if they gave you the answer choices, then you would have been able to figure it out much more quicker. So the answer to this is uh, D. Triangle ABC has side lengths and an arithmetic progression, and the smallest side has length 6. If the triangle has an angle of 120, what is the area of ABC? Okay, so I don't know what this triangle looks like, so let's just draw one. And that triangle, uh, the sides are an arithmetic progression, so A, A plus D, A plus 2D, that is what is what is an arithmetic progression. And then we have an angle. Um, if the triangle has an angle, so let's just put that 120 here. That's the one that looks most like 120 to me. Um, okay, anything else? That's it? Oh, the smallest side has a length of 6, so that's good. So that basically means that that's 6, that's 6 plus D, and that's 6 plus 2D. So then what do we do here? What is the area? Hmm. Okay. Well, you guys know how to figure out the area in terms of trig, right? If you have a triangle, and this is theta, and this is A, B, and C, the area is A times B over 2 and the sine of C. So in this case, it would be the sine of theta. So using that same formula on this guy, that looks to me like A times a plus d all over 2 sine of 120. So we know that a is 6, so that's 6, 6 plus d over 2 sine 120. And the sine of 120 is what? Root 3 over 2? Uh, I think so. So this is going to be 3 times 6 plus d times root 3 over 2. Oh, we still got a D in there. Ah, I was thinking that we're going to be done. So, oh, we can, how, how do we figure out D? Hmm. Oh, I think we have to use cosine law. Cosine law. So that's going to be, you guys know the cosine law, 6 plus 2D squared is equal to 6 squared plus 6 plus D squared minus 2 times 6 times 6 plus d, and the cos of 120. Okay, and that big long thing is going to help us figure out d. Okay, so let's do this very quickly. 36 plus 24d plus 4d squared is equal to 36 plus 36 plus 12d plus d squared minus uh, 2, um, minus 72, minus 72, uh, this, this is a negative a half. Uh, I think if you multiply through it actually will turn out to be 36. And then plus 60. Okay, so let's do this. That 36 goes with that. That will combine with that to give 3d squared. That, that, and that will combine to give plus 6d. And then we we'll bring out the 72. And then divide through by 3 and 2d, 24. And then this should factor very nicely. D, D, 6, 4, positive, negative. So therefore, D is going to be... 4, and then we can go right back here. If D is 4, that's going to be 6 plus 4, which is 10. 10 times 3 is 30. 30 divided by that 2 is 15. 15 root 3, and therefore, the answer to this is E. Last academic year, Yolanda and Zelda took different courses that did not necessarily administer the same number of quizzes during each of the two semesters. Yolanda's average on all the quizzes she took during the first semester was three points higher than Zelda's average on all of the quizzes she took during the first semester. Yolanda's average on all the quizzes she took during the second semester was 18 points higher than her average for the first semester and was again three points higher than Zelda's average on all of the quizzes Zelda took during her second semester. Which of the following statements cannot possibly be true? 
Well, we have Yolanda and Zelda, and we have first semester, second semester. And let's see here, based on what they gave us, her average, let's just call that one, is M plus three, where M is sort of the, the average of Z. So instead of putting M, well, let's just keep it as, as M. I, I, I like using M for some reason. So let me just see. It's, yeah, it's three points higher than Zelda's average in the first semester. Okay, so that takes care of that. Now, second semester, if that is Y2, and let me see here. Yolanda's average on the second semester, 18 points higher. Okay, so... Uh, since it's 18 points higher than what she did in her first semester, you're actually adding 18 to that, so that's going to be M plus 21. And then finally, the three points higher than Zelda's, so that's three points higher than Z2. So therefore, Z2 is going to be M plus 18. And I think that accurately summarizes what they say in the question. So they want... Which of the following cannot possibly be true? Okay, so what are the answer choices here? They are comparing Yolanda and Zelda for the whole academic year. Ah, okay. Uh, except for the last one, blah, blah, blah. Okay, oh, they're, they're talking about academic year, though, also. Okay, so we have to sort of look at boundaries, and then we can go back to the choices. The... Let's look at something as the maximum maximum difference. Difference between numbers. Now the smallest of these numbers is this guy, and the largest is this guy. So the maximum difference would be the largest minus the smallest. Correct? So in this case, that's m plus 21 minus m, which is 21. And therefore, if you look at A, Yolanda's quiz average for the academic year was 22 points higher. That wouldn't be possible because this, the maximum it can be is 21. Right? Because if this, for example, uh, let's see here. Yeah, if M is if if M was do I should I give it a value since it disappears it doesn't really matter what M is, yeah, so I I don't even want to give it a value, so just based on this kind of uh, comparison we can see that the maximum you could ever have in terms of a difference is twenty one so twenty two is not possible, so I will choose A as which of the following that could not possibly be true. Each of the 2023 two, balls is placed in one of three bins. Which of the following is closest to the probability that each of the bins will contain an odd number of balls? So we've got one bin, two bin, and three bin. So 2023, two, for example, could be written as 1 plus 1 plus 2021, two, two, right? So this is an odd number, this is an odd number, and this is an odd number, correct? So you can have three odds. You can also have something like mm, two evens and an odd. So you could have two plus two um, plus two zero nineteen. That's even, that's even, and that's an odd. So an even, even, odd situation is possible, and so is a two evens and an odd regardless of where you put the odd but th uh, three evens is not allowed because if you take three even numbers and add them they will be even and 2023 is an odd number so that that kind of scenario is not possible and two two odds and an even I think is also not possible so like for example you took three three and two that would be eight which is an even number and this is an odd number. Okay, so these are the only four possibilities. Now, each of these 
probability of getting an odd number is a half, probability of getting an odd number is a half, probability of getting an odd number is a half. And you multiply them, and that's an eighth. So an eighth is the probability of getting that scenario. And very, very similarly, to get even, even odd is one eighth. To get even odd, even is one eighth. And to get odd, even, even is also one eighth. So each of these four has equal probability. So the probability of getting this guy, which is odd number of balls in each of the bins, would be one out of those four, or one eighth out of the total. And you can do that also. So E is the answer. Cyclist the frog jumps two units in one direction, then two in another direction. What is the probability that he lands less than one unit away from his starting position? So let's say he starts here. Now, if he's going two units in one direction, he can go, for example, this way two units, that way two units, that way two units, all the way around. So it looks like sort of like a circle where his starting point is the center, and two units sort of represents the radius of that circle. Okay, so that takes care of the first part. Then, once he hits some point, wherever it is, he goes two more in another direction. All right. So, hmm. The program is uh, very symmetrical. So, for example, if he lands here and he goes back two, he can come back to the center. But if he comes back two, to to where to here, then he'd end up here. If he comes back two to here, he ends up there. And So let's talk about this carefully here. I got to make sure I do not draw this carefully also. So we started here at the center, right? This is the center right here. I'll just put it in red. And then we initially went up two. So we had landed here. And then if we move two in another direction, like if we go right back, we could end up back at the center. Okay, and that would qualify as landing less than one unit away. So let's say what is another scenario? If I land here, and then I move two, let's say, in this direction, where that's this was two and this is two, am I now one unit away from, this, from the beginning? Now, I actually don't know if that works out. Uh, would you land? You don't necessarily have to land on that um, a circle. I think you can land somewhere else. So l let me let me see this. L let me not draw that circle because I think that circle is kind of confusing things. So let's say you went to this direction, and then you went to not all the way back, but you went to somewhere else. So this was two. This is two. What we really want is for this distance to be one or less yeah I think I think that's the scenario yeah and then of course you could go in the other direction also so you could have gone like that and then similarly you want that distance to be one or less so anything that runs in that angle would qualify because uh, if the angle was smaller then of course that red line would be smaller you got it okay so let's do that I think that is the way to do it so let's concentrate on one of these triangles let's just put a right angle there like that and then what am I gonna do here I'm trying to figure out theta right Theta is that whole thing. So that means one of these would be theta over 4, right? Because if I did the same thing here, then that's they're all theta over 4s. So theta over 4, mm, and then this from here to here is a half. So let's use sine. Sine of theta over 4 
would be a half over 2, since 2 is a hypotenuse. So sine of theta over 4 is a quarter. And therefore, theta over 4 is the inverse sine of 1 quarter. And therefore, hmm, theta would be 4 times the sine of inverse sine of 1 quarter. Probability is what we're trying to figure out would be this angle, which the entire angle, which is from there to there, which is 4 times theta over 4, which would be theta, which is exactly uh, what we got over there, all over the entire angle all the way around, which is 2 pi in radians, which is 360 degrees. So that's 4 sine, or inverse sine of 1 quarter over pi, or 2 pi rather. So that's going to be 2 sine inverse 1 quarter over pi. OK, and the answer choices are they're using arctan. OK, I got it. Instead of using sine inverse, they're using arctan. And that, that's E in terms of matching this guy right here.